Welcome to the fourth center in women are uh, serving as women are series of the academic year, and this is the first one of 2024. Um, those of you who have been regular webinar participants, we want to thank you for sticking with us. And for those of you who are new to the webinar series, we're so grateful that you've chosen to join us today. Uh, I am Adriana Royo Perez. Uh, I am the Associate Director for Faculty Programs in the Faculty Affairs Office of the Provost. On behalf of Faculty Affairs and HSI Initiatives, I want to welcome you all. Thanks for connecting from all over uh, the country. Sometimes people from Mexico connect too. Um, we are celebrating Black History Month from February 1st until March 1st. Uh, so we celebrate the contributions that Black Americans have made to the history of the United States. And I want to emphasize the contributions that Afro-Latinos, Afro-Latinas, Afro-Latines have made uh, to this country and highlight the invaluable impact that Black Americans have had on our academic, scientific, and cultural landscape. We continue to offer this series in community from the community and to our community in Tucson, the state of Arizona, nationally and beyond. I want to thank uh, the HSI initiatives team, Monique Beltran, Dr. Carla Cruz Silva, and Marla Franco, and Dr. Marla Franco for all the efforts and support of the webinar series, and also Dr. Romero uh, for their leading efforts. Uh, do any of you want to say a few words? Now, just thank you all for being here. We're certainly looking forward uh, to launching this semester's webinar series. Um, it really provides an incredible opportunity to highlight some of our faculty and staff and the ways in which they're centering servingness in their practice, in their research, in their teaching, and their service. So uh, thank you, Dr. Arroyo, for uh, leading uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much. We begin today's webinar by respectfully acknowledging the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home of the Odom and the Jackie. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign nations, with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities throughout education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Dr. Gina Garcia's conceptualizing of the term servingness informs our webinar series. Servingness helps us to understand and highlight the faculty and staff who engage in scholarship and servingness efforts that honor the cultures and the lived experiences of Latina, Latine, and Latino, Black, Indigenous, and underrepresented students and communities. The objectives of the webinar series are to one, to spotlight current scholarship offering examples of the rich ways in which servingness is enacted by our STEAM faculty across the institution, and to learn together about engaging in these efforts and to build knowledge addressing the question each month of what the next steps are to build institutional capacity around HSI servingness. Or till our team will share the links in which you can access the recordings of the past webinars, um and also in the past years this is the fifth year we're doing this we will also record in uh, today's session so it is available as well on the same website uh, now we will uh, i will i am super excited because i will introduce uh, professor javier segura who will be our speaker this afternoon professor javier segura or javi is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Arizona School of Government and Public Policy, whose journey from a first-generation student to a distinguished academic reflects a narrative of dedication, service, and commitment to enriching lives. As a three-time alumnus of the University of Arizona with summa cum laude honors, his academic achievements underscore his intellectual dedication. However, it is his role as a Hispanic serving institution ambassador, he's very proud of that, that truly sets him apart, tirelessly advocating for an inclusive educational environment that honors the diverse experiences and cultures of Hispanic students. Beyond his academic powers, Professor Segura brings a unique blend 
of experiences to his teaching, drawing from his background as an FBI program graduate. This combination of academic rigor and real work insights creates a teaching style that is not only informative, but also deeply relatable to students from diverse backgrounds. His education extends beyond the classroom, evident in his curriculum development roles at Pima Community College and Northern Arizona University, showcasing his commitment to educational excellence across various learning environments. Engaging actively in diversity, equity, and inclusion councils at the UOPA, Professor Segura demonstrates a proactive approach, uh, approach to creating a safer and more inclusive campus. His mentoring roles at the uh, Frankie Honors College and Alpha P Sigma highlight his commitment to nurturing future leaders and thinkers, making him a shining example of the transformative power of education. Professor Segura's story resonates deeply within the university community, inspiring all to embrace the potential of education in shaping an inclusive, empowering, and reflective future. So thank you very much, Professor Segura. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí a todos los que nos escuchan. Uh, gracias, Dr. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your day to be here for this particular and meaningful webinar as well. To begin, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so to begin, my particular webinar series is called Si Se Puede, Reshaping the Safe Space Through the Power of Empathy, Mentorship, and Presence. Before I begin, I first and foremost also want to express my immense gratitude to Dr. Marla Franco, Dr. Carla Cruz Silva, Dr. Judy Marquez Cayama, Dr. Ari Adian Arroyo, Dr. Nadia Alvarez Macea, as well as Dr. Andrea Romero for allowing me to be here today, as well as for their tremendous leadership, as well as guidance and mentorship. As I like to begin my lectures in the classroom, I always start with words of affirmation. So I would encourage all of you to say this with me if you like, this is completely optional. I am intelligent. I have worked hard to be here. I am enough. And most importantly, I belong here. Every lecture that I tend to begin, I always start with words of affirmation um, as this tends to not only gear the students, but motivate them and set the foundation and the tone for the particular class. Next, I wanted to highlight this particular quote that has a meaningful um, resonance with me. And it's when the social support helps the individual feel cared about, thought of, or like they belong, is when that real magic happens. The true sense of belonging is about finding oneself, living authentically, and creating community amongst those who accept people for who they are, as they are. And throughout my particular presentation today, um, I present from a genuine, authentic approach in who I am and representing my identity and my culture. Um, my particular pedagogical techniques, my craft um, has been noted as quite different, um, where I like to engage with my students as well as incorporate in a lot of that culturally responsiveness training, as well as cultural awareness pedagogy as well. So I want to begin with who is Javi. As you could see, as I like to share a little bit about myself, I am a proud product of by and for the Sunnyside community. As a first generation college student in my family, one of the first people to go to college. Um, I, I grew up from a very um, low income family where I did not have any role models in my particular family that went to college and had a su successful career. Um, therefore, there wasn't very many options for me because I experienced that imposter syndrome um, or that particular feeling of being from the South side, being Latino, feeling not good enough to pursue education. Therefore, throughout my journey in high school, I explored college as well. However, I had to face the reality and the, the financial barrier that my family could not afford it. Um, therefore, the option for me was to go into the service. Therefore, 
I'll come back to this image as well. So during my time in the service as well, I had a great experience and decided that I wanted to get out and make a more meaningful change that was more intentional. Therefore, that's when I sought to pursue my education at the University of Arizona. Going into the university, it's a very big campus as a first generation Latino. Um, you experience that culture shock. And what I also experienced was throughout my lectures, um, I would look around and I, I would realize that, you know, sometimes there wasn't students that looked like me or even faculty that looked like me. Therefore, I would still continue to feel that imposter syndrome. And this is what ultimately fueled my ambition, fueled my motivation, was to embed myself with serving this, serving with intention, serving with purpose, serving with presence and making that change. And for a reason for a lot of my work has to surround with my Nana and Tata, um, my abuelitas, my abuelitos as well. Therefore, my Nana and Tata are my inspiration. They were very big University of Arizona fans as well but always how my grandparents always wanted to pursue higher ed at the university, but were unable to. So ultimately, along with making that positive change for our BIPOC, historically underrepresented student populations, our LGBTQ+, our veterans, our first gens, this is around my motivation and ambition for why I do what I do. Therefore, serving this as si se puede, as we can. Therefore, what's very interesting, as I like to note from Dr. Garcia, is that Hispanic and Latinx enhancing organizations enact a social justice and cur curriculum that is culturally relevant to program services and practices. And what makes us very unique at the University of Arizona, especially being an HSI with our servingness, is that we are uniquely positioned to integrate servingness into our curriculum, our pedagogical approaches, how we serve our students, our community, and our diverse student populations. And moving with this, I wanted to highlight three particular concepts in which once I became an HSI ambassador, I started to let this kind of sit and marinate in my head. And it was serving this, serving with the intention, serving with purpose, and serving with presence. When we talk about serving this with intention, what we mean is that we recognize and we appreciate and we value the diversity of backgrounds and challenges that are faced not only by our historically underrepresented populations, but also by our LGBTQ plus students, our veteran students, our Hispanic and our Latinx students as well. Now serving with purpose, this is one of the key concepts and elements that I truly take to heart that drives my craft essentially. So whenever I engage in a particular lecture, whenever I engage with the student, I approach it in the most genuine, empathetic and purposeful manner, essentially. My intention is to help the student. How can I help you? Therefore, by doing this, by serving this with purpose, we are able to incorporate the, diverse, the diversity of cultural, racial and gender perspectives. Now, most importantly, this is probably one of the most key tenets that I like to highlight, and it's serving this with presence. And what I mean by this is being genuinely present and available for our students. This means both in and outside the classroom, as well as being approachable, being attentive, being responsive. But most importantly, there's this quote that I like to say, and it's listening with the intent to understand because most of the time we listen with the intent to respond. So with listening to the, with the intent to understand, we're able to understand our students. We're able to break that barrier and come eye to eye with our students to understand them. Now, I wanna take a quick second or a quick moment and I wanna ask the audience, what comes to mind when you hear the concept of safe space? in terms of higher ed. In the particular classroom, does it mean being able to have respectful dialogue, um, have being a safe space, being able to share your thoughts openly, being open-minded, um, as well as being open-minded to dive into 
let's say, different curriculum that ha may have diverse perspectives or pers perspectives that may um, perhaps go against yours intentionally. Therefore, I want to move forward to how I particularly cultivate a safe space in my classroom, right? A safe space is you, in a classroom is an environment where students experience a sense of security, respect, but also the importance that they feel valued for who they are, and they're able to express their views in a respectful manner. Therefore, how I create these particular safe spaces in my classroom is it all starts, I'm going to move forward a little bit for time, it all starts for, it all starts from the very first day. A week prior to class starting, how I like to create this safe space is I like to send a early bird, I title it early bird, welcome email to my students. And most importantly, in, instead of focusing more on the syllabi and course schedule, what I do and what I progress in this particular welcome email is setting the foundation and letting students know that I want to take the time to warmly welcome them to my class, as well as reinforcing that they are an integral part of this course, their background, their culture, their insights, their experiences enrich and broaden our perspectives and it, it also enriches the learning experience. And most importantly, as I like to express to students, your voice matters and you matter. Next. Also, I also like to acknowledge and I highlight this in my emails as well. Students have worked hard to be here and you belong here as well. But most importantly, I also like to highlight an importance, especially in our 21st century and that's student mental health and well-being as well. I always like to not only reinforce this, but let this be one of the top priorities for my students is that I am here to help you. I am here to provide you resources. I am here for you. I am here to listen, essentially. And this is kind of how I start to kind of dive in into creating that safe space as well. Next, um, this past summer, um, this past summer, I had the phenomenal opportunity to participate in the Culturally Responsive Curriculum Development Institute that was offered. And words cannot express how enriching and how innovative this workshop was. And it not only furthered my knowledge, but it opened my eyes to a broader perspective on how to incorporate culturally responsive curriculum. So first and foremost, how I when students first look at my syllabi, um, the first thing that I tend to hear from students is, wow. And it has to deal with this reinforcement message that I often put for the students. Um, I've, throughout my experience, not just um, throughout as an undergrad and graduate student and as, and as a law student, um, I experienced you know, sometimes where it's hard being a student. Students are sometimes single parents. Sometimes students also are working three to four jobs and trying to juggle this and that motivation may not be there. And it's always a good reminder to students that they've worked hard to be here and that they belong here. And this is kind of why I just genuinely enjoy doing this as well. But most importantly, I also like to include what we call inclusivity and encouraging discussion statement. Um, for me professionally, this takes serviness to another level um, because in this particular statement that I include in all of my course syllabi, students tend to read this and understand that this classroom is a safe space. And from this point forward, as soon as, soon as students read this, it's, it's as soon as that barrier, that wall tends to come down essentially for the particular class. Another thing that I enjoy doing um, in my recent development of this course called PA 418, LGBTQ plus the law and public policy. What I wanted to do with this particular course was not only add culturally responsive curriculum to it, but to also in, um, embed a lot of the assignments. So for this particular assignment, what I had students do is create a Google Jamboard on establishing the rules for the classroom, essentially. Therefore, 
some of the comments or some of the stickies that students had placed, you know, even put don't make assumptions based on one another's gender, ethnicity, race, or background. And with this particular practice, what I found from this was that the evidence demonstrated that students, not only is this a gentle reminder that I put up in my lecture slides as well, but students always just keep this there so that they have that reinforcement of the rules in the classroom, that they understand that this is a safe space. This is how we could create our community and maintain that positive community. Therefore, moving forward onto community. Most importantly, during my time um, over in the CRCDI, the Culturally Responsive Curriculum Development Institute, I thought this was a phenomenal idea to do this and engage in community. Therefore, what I ended up doing is creating a class playlist where students in my particular class, um, as soon as they walk in, I, I normally show up about 10 minutes early before class and I have their class playlist plan that they created. Um, and when, I, when I'm in class, I have this pulled up so you'll see students with their, their phone, scanning the QR code, adding their favorite songs and it. It's a very diverse playlist. I have music from Corridos to, let's say I have some rock music, I have some Drake. It's a very diverse uh, playlist essentially. And what I tend to find is that students tend to enjoy this because it's what they created and they did it together. Um, and I have a couple of more photos as you could see. This was just yesterday um, at our community partner showcase. Um, this is an example of some of my students in my PA331 criminal justice ethics class. And with their permission, I'm able to share this photo that they took. Um, this is just an example and evidence that demonstrates the community that is demonstrated throughout my classrooms and in the safe space, um, essentially. Therefore, building community. When we build community, it's important to not only establish mentorship programs that where students could pair with one another that may have that sense of community, the same background, same experiences, but also that our student body is well represented within their community as well as their cultures and what we do. Therefore, what I also do within my lectures is always include weekly motivation. One of the key things that I found to be very, very helpful and very successful in my classroom, um, and this is something that is part of my personal growth, is when I, whenever I start a new semester, I always print the roster and I tell myself, my goal by the end of the semester is to memorize each one of my students' names. And the reason why is because the, the power that a name has and the identity, essentially. As I tell students, I do care to know your name. And I ask students, can you please help me pronounce your name? I, out of respect, I do not want to mispronounce your name. So students will correct me as well. But as I tell students, the power of your name, your, your familias took time. They took the energy to choose your name. It has a meaning behind it. And not only by doing that, I felt that too. I thought, I figured that that particular practice has just been so impactful in, in the safe space. Therefore, moving forward, I always have this up as well in my own words. When I, I call it a acknowledgement and disclosure from when I, whenever, whenever I begin my lectures. Therefore, what this is, is that I pretty much summarize the ground rules for when we dive into a particular lecture. We're going to share this safe space. We are going to share this safe space to learn. Whatever is shared in this particular space is kept in here. Identities are not shared. Our experiences are not shared. No names are shared essentially. And we always maintain respect. However, as I always, as I always um, encourage students, it's okay to agree to disagree or to disagree to agree, as long as you provide your argument in a well-respected, professional and evidence-based manner that's supported by empirical research. 
Therefore, respect is one of the key tenets that I always encourage students to engage in, in and outside of the classroom as well. In addition, as I always like to share with students in and out of the lectures, I always like to share and implement not just cultural experience, personal experience, but also professional growth experiences. So also considering the big picture, understanding and recognizing that others have their own cultural experiences. Others may bring their own heritage, their own personal identities, their own social groups, their cultural dynamics into the safe space, and that's okay as well. Most importantly, this is one of the key tenets that I always emphasize in the safe space is to grant amnesty to not only others, but to ourselves as well. It's okay to make mistakes. We are just human and it involves risk-taking. Sometimes we may not know the answer or we may not always know the right answer. And as I always um, emphasize to students, it's okay not to know. It's okay to do the research, but always it's okay to grant that amnesty, not just to yourself, but to others as well. And here I have a little quick picture of a, it was more of a student professional growth um, workshop. In my class, um, I have a particular assignment that is called a jury simulation. And within the jury simulation, what I have students do is that I have students bring in their own cultural and heritage backgrounds. And when student, and eventually students will be selected to be jurors hypothetically in the classroom or in the safe space. And when that happens, I give a particular script to students and students are able to respectfully integrate their own culture, their own heritage, their own morals, beliefs into this jury simulation. And ultimately, what the whole key point of this particular assignment is that students are able to recognize, under, understand, and also empathize the impact that cultural values as well as cultural dynamics have on law and legal and morality as well. Therefore, with this particular workshop, prior to um, diving into one of my more in-depth lectures that I had, I wanted to give this particular workshop to um, students that were seeking how to engage more in conversations with people. So what I tend to pick up with some of my students is sometimes they may be a little bit shy um, to go and introduce themselves. However, what I found is that by doing this and sharing my experience that when I was an undergrad in your shoes, that's okay, I was an introvert. That same experience you're feeling, I understand, I empathize with you. Let me show you how you could overcome this. So this is my development of that particular workshop and explaining the whole reasoning behind it. Now, most importantly, this is from one of my recent classes. Um, in my LGBTQ plus law and public policy course, how I maintain this safe space is by not in, by also encouraging open discussions in a respectful manner, but also developing um, reflection journal assignments. And with these particular reflection journal assignments, students are able to not only reflect on their own bias, values, beliefs, uh, but I ask students, what was a key takeaway or what is something new that you learned that you didn't know before? And what I found, this particular um, submission caught my eye. Overall, this very first week of class was eye, an eye-opening experience projecting a different view of LGBTQIA plus individuals that I have never been exposed to. I am now more conscious of the hardships they go through on a daily basis. So what I had students do for the particular first week of class was not only did I provide the definitions and terminology um, within our LGBTQ plus community, but I, have, I had students explore the experiences of LGBTQ plus professionals and what are some of the challenges and barriers, as well as providing some interviews as well in class of evidence-based um, research of what's going on in our society, essentially. And in these ethical reflection journals, 
um, what students are able to do is just reflect on how that particular lecture, was it the course material, was it the case law, was it that scholarly article about transgender discrimination, what particularly stuck out with you that stuck with you in which you could help for the future, essentially. Now, serving this through mentorship as well. When it comes to mentorship, mentees seek mentors with similar experiences and backgrounds and minority students often seek mentors of the same race and ethnicity. As I was a first gen undergrad, I remember the, the challenge of trying to find a mentor that could relate to being a Latino as well as a veteran growing up on the South side as a first gen student. And therefore, throughout my time, especially, it, it was a struggle. Therefore, the establish, this is why I propose the establishment of mentor programs within my particular unit for incoming students with upperclassmen as well, or even graduate students to help significantly um, create that sense of comunidad, essentially. So in this particular picture, um, these were two students that I happened to mentor in the previous academic year, as well student body president, Alyssa Gonzalez, as well phenomenal, incredible young lady. Um, I had the phenomenal opportunity to mentor her in my PA 418 class. And she was, she came to me about how can I be a better leader? How can I be a better professional? And kind of taking Alyssa under my wing and not only showing her how to um, lead professionally, but how to lead with empathy and how to understand others. Additionally, this young lady is Nadera. With Nadera, I was able to mentor her for the past three academic years as well, where Nadera aspires to be a surgeon as well. I continue to mentor Nadera and Alyssa, not only motivating them, but continuing to empower them to strive their goals. Whatever barriers, whatever road obstacles may be in your way, I always reinforce that, yes, you can, you could do it. Most importantly, I wanted to highlight um, this particular research because this is gonna lead into my next particular proposal. Uh, the benefits of mentoring Latinx students at HSIs. This was, um, this was um, sourced from FIBAS from Villanova University. And with this particular research, the mentoring or this scholarly article found that mentoring Latinx students, including veterans with personal support fostering feelings of care and connect us, uh, connectedness was found within the university setting. Therefore, with these three particular pillars, you have academic, post-college, and personal. What was found that mentoring Latinx students is that under academic, there was an understanding of classwork um, with mentors. You also had a higher earning of grades. With post-college, there was skill development. And next, oh, and next with that, you had personal. So with personal, this is a mentor providing the support, providing and also being present to empathize with the student being cared for. Part of my mentorship as well, I like to share um, these two particular um, young ladies who were actually our outstanding seniors um, for SGPP and closely mentored both of these young ladies as well, especially being from different cultural backgrounds and being from different sides of the world as well. I got to learn, um, got to learn about both of these young ladies and their culture and as well as, as well as the higher education in different countries as well. So that was absolutely phenomenal to even take it to that level. Now serving this with veterans, um, this is something that's, um, to be completely transparent, this is something that is stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit, which is what I am, I am excited about. So to begin with this, I remember my time as a veteran. I, I was young, 24, transitioning out of the military into civilian life and attending the university. Um, to be genuinely 
honest with everyone, the transition from military to civilian is a very rough transition. Um, and a lot of our veterans, the reason why they leave the military is either to pursue education and training opportunities. They either lost faith or trust in the military or their leadership, or either for family reasons, essentially. And where this leads me to is that being a Hispanic and Latino veteran, 63% of those veterans have a difficulty transitioning, the extremely difficult transition. While also 61% of Hispanic and Latino veterans, they characterize a financial transition to be very difficult. But most importantly, 56% of our Hispanic and Latino veterans characterize their overall transition to be very difficult. Therefore, when we talk about education attainment as well, pulled from 2020 out of Syracuse University, um, who conducts a partnership with a veteran organization, they found that 30% of 30% uh, of veterans post 9-11 have achieved a bachelor's degree or higher. However, this is the most darky number is that 45% of veterans either obtain an associate degree or some college and either pursue a different opportunity as well. And this is where this tends to lead me out of my comfort zone into something a little bit different. And what my particular framework that I like to call is a puente al futuro. With this, I have different particular nodes that are connected with this particular framework in which I propose. Not only this, the culturally attuned mental health is a, is a very, very big part to this. And so for me to begin, I wanna begin with the right with culture, cultural competence awareness training. With this, with this particular concept, the training goes beyond just basic awareness. And this would extend to having faculty, staff, graduate students as well, being able to understand the cultural dynamics that and the social dynamics that may shape our Latinx and Hispanic veterans as well. And then most important, most importantly, one of the, the biggest key nodes that I want to touch on is the culturally attuned mental health servingness for our veterans. Um, and what I mean by this is that being a veteran and also being a faculty member, I have a lot of students that are also veterans. And what I take into consideration when I talk about cultural competency or culturally attuned mental health serving this is that if I were to being a veteran and, and being in combat and also having PTSD and understanding that whole particular mental health aspect, it makes me be more cautious about what I demonstrate, what I talk about, because I don't want to trigger students essentially that may have that PTSD. So what I also like to do um, with that is always check up on all students, veterans or not. I just, I always incorporate what I call a mental health check-in. I ask students, hey, genuinely, how are you doing? Is there anything that I could help you with? Is there anything I could provide a resource to? And having that, that check-in um, reinforces that culturally attuned mental health servingness. All right, serving this through the power of presence, all right? So most importantly, presence. And reiterating the quote that I had mentioned earlier, we often listen with the intent to respond. And we don't listen with the, we have to listen with the intent to understand. And what I mean by this is that students, I know that often faculty members may be busy, schedules may be tight, we may have other obligations going on. But as I tell to my students, I will make time for you. Whether it's after class, I will walk with you across campus and we could talk, essentially. Therefore, being 
um, presently available for conversations, for mentorship, for support, has a big positive impact on a student's sense of belonging as well as academic success. Therefore, what when I also talk about presence, I talk about being there for students of all backgrounds and making them feel welcomed and understood as well. For example, I like to include um, these particular photos, one from a grad graduation from uh, one of my former students who graduated with her uh, GED as well. So as you see on the cap, never give up, all right? You never give up and um, being a student who faced, you know, immense barriers and challenges, continuing to not only mentor this particular student, but to be here, be there for her, be present for her, and to show up. Um, I it definitely uh, moved that young lady. And then next on the right side, um, I went back to my alma mater as I like to go back to Sunnyside High School, um, and I like to talk to a lot of our Hispanic and Latinx students, especially going through high school, where during my time in 2012, high or college wasn't even on the agenda for me. What I emphasize to these students is, look, I'm a product of the same community. Um, representation matters, period. And the, the reason why I enjoy and I love doing what I do is because I love making a positive, genuine impact for our Hispanic our Latinx students and for all of our historically underrepresented students. And as I tell my students too, I want them to be better than I was. I want them to learn from my mistakes so that they could be a better professional. Now, serving this through self-reflection as well. Most importantly, I know sometimes uh, faculty members, we may be hesitant to kind of receive feedback or sometimes we may not like to receive feedback and often we are open to feedback. As I always like to share um, with my peers and my friends, it's okay to make mistakes. We're not perfect. And most importantly, it's okay to grow. It's okay to see this perspective. It's okay to try this particular pedagogical technique. It's okay to try this assignment. Let's try this different, right? Let's integrate this, this multilingual curriculum into that. And that's kind of the key part of self-reflection. And what I kind of do as a, as a practice, as a faculty member is, what's one good thing that happened in my lecture? What's one bad thing that, or what's one improvement that I could improve on for the future as well? Now experiences within the safe space, um, after attending the CRCDI and also observing and learning from various mentors, various leaders on campus, um, I've incorporated a lot of these culturally responsive pedagogical techniques, practices, but also um, I like to, in my class, in my safe space, I like to not use titles. So I allow my students to call me Javi or Xavier by first name. And I like to kind of level that playing field. And that's just from my personal experience, but also integrating a lot of these practices. Um, I've received phenomenal feedback from when students say our professor prioritized respecting other and ourselves in, dif in difficult conversations that we had during class and allowed us to feel comfortable sharing our thoughts. For example, Professor Javi is an amazing professor. He's down to earth, honest teaching style, made the course content relevant and touching. The assignments enabled me to expand my knowledge of LGBTQ plus policy and legal issues while also learning how to make an impact as well. And so kind of just seeing a lot of um, this feedback I take it and I use it as fuel to continue to make a positive change, to continue to fuel the servingness, serving with intention, serving with purpose, but most importantly, serving with presence as well. 
And lastly, um, I would also like to close out with this particular quote, diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, belonging is an outcome by Arthur Chan. But most importantly, I wanted to kind of change this up a little bit and make it something unique and authentic. Servingness is intention. And then I wanna thank everyone for taking time um, out of your busy schedule to not only be here today, but to also hear on some of the practices and some of the servingness that I'm currently engaging in inside the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Javi. Now we have time uh, for questions. I I am always, uh, you know, I um I am in charge of organizing and managing the university wide faculty awards, and we have um, some specific awards for teaching that should you should be considering <laughs> to to be an um, a nominated for. But I always see. Uh, that's a testament of the compromise of all of our amazing professors. And as we have seen in your presentation, uh, you care for your students. Uh, from those comments, I really, yeah, I am always amazed of the students' feedback. I love it. I love to read for my own class. It's it's amazing. And you are getting uh, great feedback, great presentation, outstanding presentation. Uh, such a terrific presentation of your amazing work and and how you incorporate servingness and how you you utilize the CRCDI to transform your class that was amazing so um I see Marla turn on her camera if you want to say something or please ask questions this this was a lot I have some questions already right from looking at the presentation but I want to give the opportunity to all of the people who are a uh, watching, uh, por favor, hagan preguntas, muchas, muchas preguntas. Yeah, and while we possibly wait for some questions to percolate from those who are listening in, um, Javier, I just want to, you know, definitely um, commend you. I, I really appreciate some of the very explicit examples and strategies that you highlighted in your presentation. I mean, I think that um, as part of the efforts with our Culturally Responsive Curriculum Development Institute and as we connect with faculty um, in this conversation of what, what it potentially looks like to center servingness um, within the classroom, I think that they are eagerly, um, I think, excited to see very specific concrete examples. So, you know, even your communication standards and expectations that you um, showed us that you hold um, in your classroom. I think those are very explicit um, examples um, along with you know, some of the other practices that you described to us. So I just wanna thank you for certainly um, honing in on some of those very specific strategies, but I think those are the very things that we need to kind of be highlighting and amplifying and distributing so that faculty who really have an eagerness to take on um, more strategies to create inclusive learning environments are aware of these types of options. So um, thank you so much. This is great. Thank you, Dr. Franco. You can uh, write your question in the chat or uh, raise your hand. Um, so you can ask it orally. Anyone has a question? I do have one. Since you mentioned the CRCDI and how important it is, and I personally know uh, Dr. Judy Marquez Kiyama and the amazing work she does within the Institute. Uh, could you tell us how transformative it was? Um, how were you as a, as a professor before and after at that institute? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Arroyo. So me, I'm, I'm very um, transparent, very honest with my students, as they know. Um, and so kind of coming into the university as a young career track, I, I experienced imposter syndrome, essentially, because I, I felt like, well, you know, a lot of professors have been teaching for years and, you know, I may not be as experienced or as equipped as them. So when I attended the CRCDI, I was, I was hungry to learn information, to learn 
practices. And so I would always ask um, Dr. Marquez Gayama questions. I would go up to her, what do you think about this? I would also ask um, Dr. Nicolazzo, I would ask her, um, what do you think of my syllabi and changing this up? And so Dr. Nicolazzo also guided me on the right path. And so going through the CRC DI, um, it helped me grow, not just professionally, but personally as a person. And it opened my eyes to understanding more of empathetic approaches, but understanding what our Hispanic and Latinx veteran populations are also going through. And um, kind of highlighting that work, I had talked to Dr. Um, Cody Nichols after the CRCDI, because I had a couple of strategies about maybe implementing a lot of the culturally responsive practices into veteran type of events as well. Um, and so we talked about um, some of the research that I was kind of doing, looking at different frameworks on how to kind of do that. And so after the CRCDI, it definitely, it transformed me into a more culturally aware faculty member. Thank you very much. And I can see it through the um, through your students' feedback. It's it's amazing. I always get emotional when, when I read those. And I think we have time for one last question. Um, you mentioned mentoring. Uh, this is very important. We have been working on developing tools for faculty and for students. But can you talk uh, to you about your experience, uh, maybe as a mentee, and now you are a mentor of your students? Absolutely. Um, just starting from my experience um, as an undergrad, you know, I, I sought a mentor that had maybe the same identity as me, and, and that was very rare to come by. And as a mentor, now reflecting, um, I've also engaged in the Mentor Institute with Dr. Christina Rivera. And with that, that helped me grow as a better mentor for my students. And when I mentor my students, I'm very honest. I share with them the bigger picture. And, and for example, when students, I have students that, oh, well, when I graduate, I'm going to go do this, this, and that. Well, I tell students, I said, I'm just going to share some professional advice with you that maybe you could take this into consideration is that sometimes things don't always work out as as you planned and that's okay that's okay as long as you have a plan a a plan b a plan c that's okay and i said what's the worst that could happen you try something out you don't like it okay there's plan b you go to plan b you try it okay you got the experience you got to try it and so that's what I share a lot of that, that I guess you could say raw, that real personal experience with my students so that they could understand. Um, and that's what being a mentor um, is about, is being there for the students, listening to them, understanding them, understanding the challenges, the barriers, what they go through, and how we could best serve them. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I am really proud of, of all the work you do. Um, I I want to take your class too, right? On <laughs> LGBTQ, the law. Um, Sebastian says, I really like the fact that you make this about the students, yes. And just being human against one-sided. Uh, thank you very much for your humanistic approach. Uh, for incorporating incorporating servingness, as Marla said, uh, and and you are a champion, right, of all the initiatives, uh, uh, HSI initiatives, and a stellar faculty member. Uh, thank you very much for for this presentation, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, some people, I guess, had to go, but this will be recorded for us and for all uh, people to 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 be able to see and. Please stay tuned for our next month's webinar series. Thank you very much.